Welcome to the Project Endure podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Before we get started, let me thank you for being here. The stories on this podcast are meant to let you know that you're not alone in what you're going through and that we can all find strength in struggle with the right perspective. If you've been enjoying the podcast, let me ask that you leave a review on your platform of choice to help us grow so that we can continue to make the world a better place, one conversation at a time. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to the Project Endure podcast, episode 96. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very, very, very special guest down in Texas, Matt Johnson. Matt, what's going on, man? Man, uh, it's finally, you know, it's good to, it's good to be here with you. Um, you know, we've, we've kind of followed each other for a little bit now, and then we met at uh, the Athlete Ambassador Weekend and, you know, kind of have, have been uh, you know, active through social media with each other since. And then, you know, now here we are. So who would have thought? Yeah, man, it's cool. I mean, social media gets a bad reputation sometimes. However, I think if you use it for good, it can be really, really good. And admittedly, we followed each other for a while, but I was telling you before we hit record, I don't know a whole lot of your life story. And that's one of the coolest parts about sitting down for these podcasts is I get to learn along with the audience so much about the guest. And so if we were to just start real simple, you know, Matt Johnson, how would you introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, through my, through my life, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 20 year, 28 years old. Uh, I've worn a lot of hats. I've lived a lot of places. I've done a lot of things. Um, you know, if you want to, we, we can fast track the process, but, uh, you know, didn't, uh, I grew up with just me and my mom, um, you know, didn't have the best childhood. She tried to give me the best childhood that, that I could have, but, uh, you know, we struggled and we moved around a lot. Um, we lived in a double wide trailer at one point. Uh, you know, there was multiple times when I was younger that, uh, my mom would watch me eat because we wouldn't have, wouldn't have enough. And, um, you know, I needed to eat. So, uh, you know, growing up, it was, it was hard times, um, graduated high school and, uh, decided to join the military. And I think that was, you know, it kind of goes one in one with, with my childhood and looking for that, that family aspect and, um, you know, the camaraderie and, uh, you know, trying to find that. So, um, joined the national guard. So that way uh, I could come back home cause I was still a mama's boy. Uh, you know, did that, came back home and, um, you know, got an active duty job and I worked active duty within the national guard for, uh, a very long time. Um, during that process, I actually, uh, I raced sprint cars, which you can kind of, for those of you out there that really don't really know what that is, it's like, a you have a lot of sprint car drivers that will race NASCAR. So it's kind of a, uh, in simple terms, it's like a step down or, you know, it's when it comes to like college football and, you know, getting to the NFL is NASCAR. So I was, I was on the track. So I did, uh, you know, dirt, dirt track racing, raced all around the Midwest. Um, while I was active duty, got stationed in Virginia, had to sell all my stuff. So I had to give that up. Um, but 2021, speaking of that, that's, that's when it all started. And, uh, which is crazy to say because of all the things that we've done in in the, in the short amount of time, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't an athlete in high school. I wasn't an athlete in the military. Um, I wasn't, I was, I was just, I was just me back then. Um, and that me is a completely different me than, than everyone sees right now. And, um, you know, dove into, in 2021, when we moved out to Virginia, um, dove into David Goggins and <clears throat> there was a lot of trails. We were very rural and I picked up running and would listen to books. And I tell you what, I can't even remember the last time that I read a book before 2021, but, um, you know, I started listening to, to David Goggins and, um, listened to his book and then got into, you know, listening to Jocko Willick and listening to, um, finding Nick bear and, uh, yeah, the rest, the rest has been, has been written in 2022 and then now into 2023. 
but fast track of a story that's that's how we got to where we are now there's a lot to unpack there and i'm excited for it <laughs> i gave one, you i gave you a lot i gave I, I just i threw it at you it's great man and, and one of the things that i'm trying to get better at as an interviewer is asking the questions that i might not have asked a year ago or two years ago or three years ago and you know i think we've all had that experience we're listening to a conversation that we're not a part of and you think, oh man, I, I wish the I wish they asked this question, but it would be kind of a little bit awkward or tough or hard. And when I was listening to your story, you you talked about it was you and your mom growing up. Um, what, what if you don't mind me asking? You don't have to answer. Wh what happened to your dad? Was he in the picture at all? What, what was that situation? Yeah, so uh, so my mom got pregnant super young. Um, uh, my mom uh, had me in March. Um. Her, so she turned 18 in, in January and she had me in March and she graduated high school in May. And <clears throat> yeah, so um, my dad was never in the picture. Um, he wasn't ready. And, you know, that's OK. Um, I 100 uh, percent. My mom is 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 a hell of a woman and she's a very strong woman. She was working, uh, you know, two to three jobs just to just to provide for me taking me at you know 4 a.m to my grandparents house so they could watch me while she would be gone at work until eight nine o'clock at night and then you know would come home and we would have a snack together and and you know I would I would go to sleep and we'd do it all over again the next day and she took me she took me fishing she took me you know anything and everything that she could she could try to do for me she did um but yeah I will uh I will have a, a love for my mom for the rest of my life that you know, I really don't think that that some people, you know, that 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 grow up with both parents, they'll never understand it. But um, yeah, my mom, my mom played both roles. That's really special. Um, so we'll, we'll dive in with a, a big question here and then we can let it take us where it will. But when you look back at your life so far in those 28 years, what's the hardest thing that you've ever had to handle that you didn't get to choose for yourself? Yeah. So, um, you know, like what a lot of people don't know is um, at the beginning of the year, uh, I was faced really with um, a little bit of, I call it adversity. Um, so I went through a divorce uh, at the beginning of the year in kind of started in late January that I really wasn't ready for. I really didn't see it coming. Um, and, you know, having to battle through, having to battle through that in my own way, um, and, you know, try to figure out like, you know, we had chatted a little bit before we started recording, you know, figure out what the next move was. And um, that's something that a lot of people are just now going to find out when they listen to this. Um, but, yeah, that's something very recent was was most definitely the the hardest thing that, you know, I had to I had to navigate and figure out. If you don't mind me asking, how long were you and your wife together uh, or are are you still together at this point recording this? Um, no, we're not. So um, we were together for five years um, and, and just had some struggles. Um, you know, it, it's it's very hard um, navigating a marriage um, while also trying to balance out all the things of life, um, you know, with social media and um, major growth on social media and traveling so much and the military. And, um, she was very young and, you know, um, I mean, I'm young too, but, uh, you know, people change and, and things happen and sometimes sad enough to say, you know, sometimes growth goes in opposite directions and, you know, I wasn't expecting it. Um, I didn't see it coming. Um, you know, but I'm not, I'm not upset at, at, at the situation. Um, I truly believe that, you know, she had to go in one direction to, to grow the way that she wanted. And, um, I have to go in my direction to grow the way, the way that I want. But with that being said, you know, I don't, I don't ever believe that that divorce is the answer. Um, but sometimes in life you are handed something that you didn't want. Mm. And it's at that moment that you have two choices to, to figure out which direction you're going to go. Uh, yeah. It's really hard when, when two people are trying to navigate 
a shared life headed in the same direction together, theoretically, but also growing as individuals. And like you said, if that happens in opposite directions, okay, where does that lead? And in this case, you know, this is where you are. Um, if you were to go back in time, rewind five years, six years, would you change anything looking back? I would not a hundred percent. I would not. Um, I, you know, I definitely believe in, in, in my faith and, and, you know, everything that's supposed to happen in your life is supposed to happen. And, uh, you know, I loved all the, all, all of the last five years. I learned so many things. I, uh, we did so many things together. Um, you know, but, uh, the choice was made and, you know, I had to, I had to then make my choice on, on, you know, what I needed to do next. But, um, I, I, I truly, I truly don't regret anything in life because I, I really do believe that everything happens for a reason and, and it will lead you down the path that, you know, you were meant to be on. Yeah. What compelled you to share that part of your life on this podcast? Because I can't imagine it's an easy thing to speak in this conversation, knowing that many people will, will listen. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've spoke with many friends before you and I, you know, got on here and have, have consulted with many people and, um, you know, about bringing this up because it, it definitely isn't a, isn't an easy thing to talk about. Um, but you know, it's what this podcast is about, you know, enduring and doing hard things. And sometimes that's not always fitness and, um, you know, it can branch off into any other aspect of your life. So, um, what led me to talk about this is, uh, you know, like I said, it was, it was the hardest thing I'd ever, I'd ever gone through. And when you go through something like that, you know, yes, people are there for you, but when you lay your head down at night, you are alone and you have to sit with that. You have to sit with yourself. You have to reflect, you have to think. And like I said, it comes down to it. You have two choices to make. And those two choices are you sit and you sulk in it and you let it tear you down and beat you up and destroy you. Or you make the choice to stand up, to stand your ground and to move forward step by step every single day because you that's what you have to do in order to move on, in order to continue, in order to endure. You have to continue taking steps forward. And my biggest thing with sharing all of that was that, you know, if there's someone out there that's going through something so hard that it is destroying them, this isn't the end of the world. It's not. I promise you, I can tell you that I, I sat there and I sulked in it. I was sad about it. I let it destroy me for a certain amount of time and, but with that being said, the last four weeks of my life have been something that I could have never dreamed of. And if I would have let that moment in time destroy me and take me away from that, I would have never experienced it. And I would have never been here to talk about it. So that's, that's a hundred percent why I wanted to open up and, and, you know, communicate that today. Well, I appreciate the fact that you, you are, and you're doing it so well. And there's a quote from Haruki Marakami who said, despite your best effort, people are going to hurt when it's time for them to be hurt. Life is like that. And I, I feel like there's just no avoiding it. And the people who try to run from the pain, run from the hurt, run from the struggle, they're the ones who end up experiencing it the most. And I think it's the people who can embrace it, who can stand back up and fight the fight, walk into the resistance and not shy away from it are the ones who get through it and come out the other side stronger. Now you dealt with this the way that you dealt with this. And um, I don't want to share what those four weeks you alluded to where I want you to share that. Um, but were the past four weeks, some of the hardest weeks you've ever had that you've chosen to do on purpose? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. 100%. So you know, um, I, I fought, I fought my demons. I went through what I needed to. And, you know, I had already had some opportunities coming up, um, in the, in the fitness world, but, um, I kind of decided that I needed, I needed an outlet and I needed to 
put myself out there and I needed an, like I said, I needed an outlet for, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. I needed an outlet for my energy. I needed to let it out. I needed to get back to doing hard things. And that, that is truly, that is truly me. And, you know, I, I went through my, my coping process. I went through, um, the sadness, the hurt, the pain, and I trained my way through it. And then one day, you know, I, I woke up and I had these two events that didn't both need to happen at the same time. And, uh, I had these two events coming up and, you know, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to do both of them. Um, and yeah, it was a very, uh, eye opening, a very faith opening, uh, it, it it's it's almost unexplainable what I went through in those, you know, the week leading up to both of these races and the week leading out of both of these races. It's 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 very hard to truly explain, but I'm sure we're 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 gonna dive into it. Yeah, let's break it down. So to be clear, um the question that I ask at this point in the podcast typically is what is the hardest thing that you've ever done on purpose and why did you do those things? And so why don't you share what those two things were and then let's just go in chronological order and let's go through both of them. Yeah. So first off, I'm going to say that I attempted to do the Leadville 100 with 29 days notice. And that was not even remotely close to what we just did. <laughs> so I'm going to start by, by, by throwing that out there. Um, but yeah, so uh I had signed up for Ironman Texas um, back in 2022 and went through the process to started training for Ironman and was training kind of November, December timeframe. And we were going to gear up to go into an Ironman block um, January, February, March race in April. We were going to throw down and send it. And uh, in January, I got a call from uh, Austin Clare who um, is the ambassador athlete manager for BPN. And I answered it and he said, do you want to come run BPN? And I'm like, when is it? And he says, April 16th. And I hold, and I open up my calendar. And I'm like, that's six days before Ironman Texas. And he's like, well, can, can you just defer it? Can you defer it and come run? I'm like, yeah, okay, let's defer it. That's a great idea. Let's do it. Click, bam, that was wrote down, defer Texas, race BPN. Got it. So... Um, I emailed Texas, Ironman Texas. I said, Hey, I want to defer. Um, it took them, it took them up until the end of March to email me back. Mm. So now, as all of you know, that have been listening to this, everything that we went through in January, February, March, um, had already happened. I had stopped training for Ironman because I wasn't going to do it. And uh, in March, I got an email from Iron Man saying, Hey, sorry, we got your email. You can defer if you still want to. And it was kind of at that moment where I'm like, I'm like, this, this could, this could be a pretty cool story. And this could be a pretty cool outlet for me to, to expend this energy and to, you know, to give what I need to give. So decided that, you know, we're going to do Ironman Texas and we're going to do the BPN marathon. So, and, you know, like I've, I've alluded back to a hundred times, you know, is to just to harness all that energy and all that buildup. And I hadn't raced since August and that was September, October, November, December, January, February, March, that's eight months. And truly like you know, as cliche as it is, my, my life is, is I do hard things and that's my outlet, whether it's in training, whether it's in racing, whatever it is, like I have to do something hard every single day. I have to, otherwise, otherwise I will explode. That's, that's, that's the way I, I, I think that my life is. So, um, you know, we spent, I put it out on social media, um, that we were going to do it. And I actually got a lot of a lot of backlash, um, a lot of questions on, you know, y you have Leadville, you, you know, you're going to, you're going to hurt yourself. Why would you do this? There's no way, um, you know, you're going to try to run sub three and then go do an Ironman that th this doesn't happen. And that was the, that was the first time in my life that I had ever had that type of social media reaction to, you know, to me like that and it lit a fire and i loved it i mean it it like 
I would thinking back on that, if you would have told me that that would have happened, I would have probably told you that I would have been sad and upset and like it would have ruined my day. But it just like I smiled at it. I loved it. I'm like, yes, like like this is exactly what I this is what I wanted. Um, And I'm very much a, a verbal you know person. I, I truly believe in 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 speaking. You know, if you want it, you need to speak it. If you believe it, you need to speak it. If you if you want it, you need to visualize it. If you believe it, you need to visualize it. And so I spent that entire week leading up to the BPN marathon. Um, I disconnected from everybody. I was still on Instagram, but from my friends down here in Austin um, to I, I, I stayed at home. I cooked. I mean, I weighed out all my food. I cooked all my meals. I, I, I didn't leave the house besides to, you know, let the dog out and to train and disconnected from everybody and just spent that time visualizing my success and what what was going to happen um for reference last year when i ran the bpn marathon um was the first time i had met nick and uh went into went in there you know met him and nick bear and met him and shook his hand and he's like what are you gonna run tomorrow and i'm like i'm going sub three man like and i had no idea what i was gonna do and he's like, okay, like, you know, what are you going to go sub like, like by how much? And I'm like, I'm running a 259.59 and I'm leaving. And we ran a 259.52. <laughs> I mean, we had, we had eight seconds. I mean, so like, that's truly just, you speak it, it's, it's going to happen. And if, if you believe it, you have to speak it, you have to believe it, you have to visualize it. And I promise you, if you do that over and over again, to the point where you almost make yourself sick, it's going to happen. And leading up to that, um, there was a lot of, you know, I wanted to go sub 250. I wanted to go 255. Um, the main goal that we set was to go sub three in the marathon. And then six days later to do Ironman Texas in Houston and go sub 12. And leading into leading into BPN, um, we ended up going 250, 254. And we won it, which was insane. Just crazy. And... I mean, the, the pure happiness that I felt that day is something that, that, and I put this on Instagram is, and I, and I really mean, this is something that I wish and hope that every single person in this world can somehow one day find. And I wanted to read a text message. We actually stopped the podcast a little bit ago and um, being very open with you guys here. I wanted to read a text message from a good friend of mine where I, I was telling you guys about harnessing this energy. And um, the marathon was really the first, it was really emotional for me when I finished it because it was, it was the first all out effort that I had given since, you know, I had been through the ringer and, you know, had to, you know, m change my whole life, move to Austin and, and all of this. So I wanted to read this text message. This is from, um, it's from a good friend. Uh, his name's Bobby Dautrick. He's a great guy. Um, he texted me and asked me how I was feeling, how I was doing. And uh, he said this. He said, stay out of your head. You have one goal, complete, domin complete domination. You need to harness all of the negativity, all of the heartbreak, and all of the uncertainty. There's no more excuses, no more what ifs, no more injuries, no more it just wasn't my day. We don't do that. You are Matt Johnson. It's time to show them. Bob sent me that text message. I was on the bus. I was on the bus on the way to the BPN marathon. And I think that guy won it for me. I think he, there was a lot of other words in there that I had to like, <laughs> that I really navigate around right now. But that man, that message right there, um, that got me. And, and it's, it's so true, you know, to be able to navigate all of the issues in your life and be able to block that out and not really even block it out just, but to be able to use it, to be able to use that fuel for anything that goes wrong and being able to turn it positive and, and, and go, we went, we went way onto a rabbit hole here and, and, but that's the BPN marathon. There's the, that's, that's part one. That was good, man. So a um, couple things. One, um, your friend Bob sounds like an incredible human and uh, we all need that friend in our lives. And uh, two, there's there's this uh, phrase and I can't remember where I heard it, but uh, it goes, people will never know how much violence it took to become this gentle. 
Yes. And and right, I think like the world didn't know that, you know, quote unquote violence you had been through in the months leading up to that performance. And now that they have that context, I think it makes a little bit more sense why you were able to harness what you harnessed for the marathon. And so you get to the finish line, you experience this joy, this happiness, you're on top of the world. And in six days, you have Ironman Texas. And so what's going through your mind once that all dies down a bit? You know, so I I, I, I hit the finish line and uh, were you there in 2021 or 2022? I was supposed to be, but I had COVID, so I missed so, it. Okay, so there's like a there's like a table where everyone's bags are. And I get up to this table and I think it was Gabe. I can't remember who it was, but I get up there to this table and I get my bag and someone goes, and now you have an Iron Man in six days. And I'm like, oh no. Like I didn't even it, it wasn't there yet. Like I had just finished, but like I'm like, oh man, this is you're right. Yeah, you're right. I do. Um but yeah, that week, you know, it, it it it's so hard to even think about that week because it was it was such a huge accomplishment and such a thing that I true like I needed that. I needed to make like I needed to stamp that down. I needed to you know, the, here here we go cliché. I needed to prove myself right. And 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 I did it. And so like going into like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, like it was, it all just wraps together. I just remember, I remember eating whatever I wanted and I eat and I eat so healthy, but I remember like I would go to the grocery store to grab something and I grab like two Snickers bars <laughs> and I'm just like, you know what? Like this has to help recovery. Like I'm literally doing an Ironman in, in four days. And, and for all of you out there that, that don't truly know an Ironman build, um, is, you know, 12 to 16 weeks. Uh, I had completely stopped Ironman training in December and this is April. So I had had, I had been on the bike twice for maybe three hours at the most. And I got in the pool once with Natasha and then I got out and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, this is so hard. I don't even want to know how hard it's going to be when we do this. So I'm done. I'm getting out. Like I just, I'll just experience it then. And she had some words for me, but we'll leave it at that. Um, so yeah, I'd swam once and biked a couple times. So yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was crazy. We did it on Sunday and we left for Houston on Wednesday. So we, we slept on Sunday, woke up Monday, recovered Monday, Tuesday, and we were off to Houston on Wednesday. Wow. And so you get to Houston, you get all set up, you're prepared. Uh, race then is Saturday, Saturday. Okay. So yeah. take us to race, take us to race day. Yeah. Um, it was very like. For reference, my first Ironman um, that I trained for was Ironman Des Moines in 2022. And I went like 10, upper 10 fifties, got super sick on the bike, was throwing up, had a terrible race, went 10 fifties. So when I set the goal of sub three, sub 12, I was allotting for, you know, I remember my swim time in Des Moines was 72 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, if I swim an hour and a half, and then I was like, my bike time was a 525, but I got sick. So let's give myself six hours on the bike. And then my run time in Des Moines was even worse because I was so sick at that point. It was like a four and a half hour marathon. I'm like, I can do a four hour marathon. And I'm like, okay, that equals out to be like 1140. Let's get it. And um, yeah, so leading up to race day, like I had this plan and I was so confident. Like I had built up so much confidence just speaking it and then taking that exclamation point from the BPN marathon. I, I truly, I didn't have a worry in the world. I didn't like and that was the first time ever that I had truly went into a race where I didn't like, I wasn't panicking and and not, not into a race. Okay. Des Moines number first Ironman in 2022, I was sick the day before. Like I was, I, you know, how do I do this? How do I do that? I got to pack this drop bag. I got to pack that drop bag. My swim gear goes in here, even to the point of, I took my bike to transition. So you have to take your bike and you have to um, drop off your bike and then you have to drop off all, all your bags, right? So like you come out of the water and then you get your run bag and then you come off the bike and you, nope, you come out of the water, you get your bike bag and then you get on your bike. Then you come in from your bike and you get your run bag. Like you have to take all these bags down there. I didn't even pack my bags, Joe. I totally forgot. Like I, t I get my bag or I get my, I get my bike and we park like two miles away. Me and Christian, one of my buddies that with NBDM 
and we we ride our bikes down there and we put our bikes there and I see everyone carrying their carrying their bags. And I'm like, oh no. I'm like, I haven't even packed my bags yet. This is the day before the race. So put the bike there, go back, pack up the bags. Like I I just I didn't have a worry. I I, I didn't. And and that's great. That that can be a great. It can also be very bad. It really, you know, you really need to be careful with that. But um yeah, I think I think that's truly what led the, to the success is that I was I was truly content at that point. I knew that I had get, I gave it everything I had at BPN and I knew whatever was going to happen was going to happen and it was already wrote in stone and I was ready to accept whatever I was going to find at that at that finish line. And so if if you could give us a glimpse into the swim bike run, were there hard moments for each was were yeah, tell us about it. Yeah. So, uh, getting in the water, um, it's really hard to explain if, if, if you're not really into this type of stuff, um, open water is terrifying. It's so scary. Like you can't see anything in the water. And then when you swim, like you have to be able to sight to see where you're going. And like, here I am, I'm ignoring all of these red flags that I should have, you know, I should have at least been in the water before this race. So the biggest part for me that was an issue during the swim was sighting. Um, you know, as you're as you're swimming, your head's in the water and you're breathing, but you also have to lift the neck up and sight and then come back down into the water. So imagine like your head, you're breathing to the left, you're making a circle, you're sighting up ahead, and then you're right back down in the water. So that was causing some really severe neck issues because my muscles weren't used to it. And on top of that, the sun was in my eyes, my goggles were fogging over. Anything that could like probably go wrong in the water was was going wrong. People were grabbing my ankles and it was the Ironman swim is just garbage anyways. So that's why people truly prepare for it. You know, that's why a normal person prepares. Uh so I I I I set the goal of an hour and a half. I went uh, I think like 129. Um came out of the water just completely delusional. I mean, like, like I hadn't been, I mean, truly like imagine, you know, you're, you're in water swimming for an hour and a half and you haven't even been in water in months, you know, and your equilibrium's off. Like I'm trying to climb up this ladder to get out of the water and my whole entire world is just falling to the right. And like, I'm looking at everyone standing up, like everyone looks like they're just standing sideways and everything that was, it was just, it was tough, but got out of the water, got on the bike. Um, my biggest accomplishment during this Ironman was to, to do what I did was eating. And, uh, I had a field bar. Literally there's a picture of me running through transition, dripping wet with a field bar in my mouth with like half of one, like ha half of it's like ripped off. I have a field bar in my mouth. I have a helmet on. Like I just, I look like this is my first time and I have not a clue what I'm doing. And so I ate this field bar and then I had one of those Ben and Larry's cookies, you know, those massive, yeah. like, and I'm on the bike like this and I'm stuffing this, I'm, I'm on the bike, like all scrunched up and I'm stuffing this cookie into my mouth and get onto the bike. And the hardest part during the bike was it was six miles to a toll road. And then it was 25 out, 25 back, 25 out, 25 back, six miles back to the, to the, the run transition. So the hardest part for me was, you know, my legs weren't really used to be on the bike, but it was my butt. Like, cause I hadn't, you know, I hadn't been sitting on the bike. So like, there was a lot of times that I would have to like stand up on the bike and just like pedal like an idiot because my butt hurt so bad. And going out, we had a 17 mile an hour headwind coming at us. And then, so we're going like 15 miles an hour for 25 miles going out on this toll road. And then you turn around and you're flying like a rocket ship. And all I, and all I could think of for, I think we went 540. My goal was six. We went 540, but the entire time, like I was just sick to my stomach because my butt hurt so bad. It That was just the worst part. And for days after, like I was waddling, like my butt just hurt, man. That was terrible. So bad. Uh, and, you know, it's it's funny because so far, like the fitness component itself has not been the issue. It's been, you know, you know, not having been in the water, not having been on the bike. And so yeah. now you, you get to the run and you're, yes. you're at the home stretch. Only a marathon left. Yep. Only, only a marathon. <laughs> um, 
it was great. So I got off the bike and like I said, like I fueled on the bike. So we probably, for reference, we probably pushed around, um, around a hundred to 150 carbs per hour on the bike. So, um, 600 to 700 carbs while I was on the bike and I came off the bike for the first time ever. Granted, I've only done one other Ironman, but I came off that bike and I felt like, I felt like Iron Man himself. I was like, here we go. Like, this is, this is wild. So it was a three lap course. I did lap one. And at that point you get, you know, you're, you're nine to, you know, eight to nine hours into a race. You're kind of goofy no matter what. And I couldn't, I was trying to do math in my head to understand where I was at in the race. Like, I didn't care about my position. I'm like, dude, like we said sub 12, we're going sub 12, but I had no idea how long I was out there and I couldn't add up my swim or my bike. I mean, how hard would it have been to go? Okay. I went, you know, let's just give myself some time. I went six hours and then I went an hour and a half. Okay. We're at seven and a half hours. That means we could run a four and a half hour marathon. Like I was fine, but I couldn't, I couldn't get that in my head. So I came around to my coach and I see him and he's sitting there and he's just, he's just chilling. And it was, it was, it made me, it made me so upset, but it was exactly what I needed He's sitting there and I run past him and he kind of like gets up with me and I'm like, where, where, where am I at? Like, I'm like, I don't, I don't understand my time. And he's like, I'm not sure. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, I had so much hatred in my heart at that very moment. Oh my gosh. I go, what do you mean? You're not sure. And he goes, you're so close. You have to keep up this pace right here. And I'm like, what in the heck is going on? I'm like, am I really that close? And you know, for reference, uh, I was holding about a seven fifteen pace, um, which is truly a pretty, uh, I don't know if the word elite is right, but it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty good for coming off of the bike, uh, especially post marathon and post marathon six days ago. Um, so I did my second lap and I saw my friend, Tony and he's running next to me and He's like, you know, you're the best. Like, you're like, you got this and let's go. And I'm like, Tony, what, where am I at? I'm like, I'm like, I'm cussing Mike up and down. I'm like, he didn't tell me, like, he didn't do this. He didn't do that. And I'm like, I'm not going to make it. And he goes, he goes, you have one more lap, eight miles. So about, about an hour, less than an hour, 50 minutes. He goes, you have one more lap. You're at 930. And I'm like, whoa. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm like, look again, refresh it, refresh it. And he's literally sprinting next to me in vans. I'm like, refresh it. And he's like swiping down on his phone to like get the app to refresh. And he's like, no, dude, you're at 930. And at that moment, I said, holy cow. Like we had already did it, right? Like, like right then and there. And so then I set a personal goal of, I wanted to run a, a sub 330 marathon off the bike. And... I was going to be close. I had to keep that pace up. And if anyone's running a, if anyone knows a marathon, um, you hit that wall, no matter what, no matter who you are, you're going to hit a wall at 18 to 20. So I knew I had to give it everything I had. Um, long story short there, we, we, we went 328 and, you know, accomplished the overall, overall Ironman time was a, uh, 10, 10 forties. So I PR'd the Ironman. I went 20, 24th, 25th overall age group. Um, and, we, and we did it. We set the world on fire, man. It was, it was, it was, it's unexplainable. The, the feelings I had at that finish line. Have you come down from the high yet? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think, I don't think so. I don't know when I ever will. Like I want to, I want to tell my kids about this. I mean, I want to tell, you know, come down from the high. Yeah, probably. But I wake up every day and I think about it and, and not, you know, yeah, we won the BPN marathon. We went two fifty four. That's, that's a great, that's a, that's an elite marathon, but anyone else could have shown up and ran a 252 and beat me. Um we went 24th overall in my age group at Ironman Texas. I went 9th overall in Des Moines with a with a slower race. 
it's all subjective. It's all, it's all who shows up and who does what the biggest thing for me coming off, you know, and I, and I know, I know that I'm not the greatest marathon runner to ever live. And I know I'm not the greatest triathlete to ever live, but the biggest thing for me and the high coming off of this is I said, I was going to do this. I told people I was going to do this. And I told myself that I was going to do this and we destroyed it. And that gift is greater. That win, that victory is greater than one I've ever experienced. The victory to, to, like we said earlier, to prove myself right, to, to show others that you can do these hard things and, and set goals, speak goals and destroy goals. And that's, that's the high that I'm still living on. I don't, I don't care if I, if I got dead last, I mean, if I set a goal and I destroy it, I'm that that's where I am right now. Yeah. I mean, those sentences were written and after everything was said and done, you put the exclamation point on them. That's special. I put a couple of them. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I think, uh, you know, those couple of weeks lend themselves well to the next question, which is again, a simple one. When you hear the word endurance, what does that mean to you? It means something very different to me now than it does. If you would have asked Matthew in 2022, or if you would have asked him in 2021, or if you would have asked him in 2020, um, you know, we, we just said the word subjective and, and I feel like endure can be endure is subjective hard is subjective and endurance and hard can very much so go one and one with each other Mm -hmm. um endurance to me is obviously you know to endure it's to keep going it's the same thing as the phrase that that you know comes out of bpn you know exactly what's coming the the go one more it's it's to keep going but where i got lost in endurance what's changed for me now is I thought it meant fitness. Mm. I thought it was only, I thought it meant racing. If you would have asked me years ago, the last three years, and you said, what is endurance? And I'm like, whoever can go the longest in a race. Absolutely not. You know, applying, you know, you have endurance in all aspects of your life. You know, how much can you go through? How much can you do? Um, How much can you take? you know, what can you endure? I'm still using the same word here, but you know, what can, how much can you take and continue to be productive and continue to move forward and continue to keep taking those steps forward to better yourself? And I feel like, you know, endurance, endurance to me is, is, is exactly that. It means how much can I take coming at me and still continue to take steps forward in progress in my life. I'm going to read a quote from Dean Karnazes, uh, who's an ultra runner. It's, it's on the longer side. So bear with me. Um, He said, I think we run a hundred miles through the wilderness because we are changed by the experience. What takes a monk, a month of meditation, we could achieve in 24 hours of running with each footstep comes a slow diminishment of self the prickly edges of ego whittled down until something approaching the divine emerges. Even during a race with no shortage of human folly, great moments of clarity are achieved. Running an ultra marathon builds character, but it also exposes it. We learn about ourselves. We gain deeper insights into the nature of our character, and we are transformed by these things. To know thyself, one must push thyself. And I feel like in a way, that's what endurance means to you. It's, it's, it's different, it's similar, and it's amazing because it's hard. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and like we said before, you know, you, you, you coined the phrase, you know, the do hard things and, and you love that. And when you can truly pair hard and endurance together, because, you know, to be able to hold something longevity wise, it's not always going to be easy. And if it is easy, it's not worth it. And yeah, yeah, 100%. And, and, and onto that one, you know, when, with you reading that quote, um, like we spoke about earlier, you know, Leadville 100 on 29 days notice. And my mom didn't have the chance to go to Leadville. 
And I remember coming back and she's like, you like, you're different. And I'm like, you know, what, what, what do you mean? She's like, you're just, there's something Leadville changed you. She's like, something changed. And I'm like, is this, you know, is it bad? Like, is this, you know? And she goes, no, no, it's just, she's like, something is different. I'm like, well, mom, that it almost destroyed me. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, I'm like, I almost died up there. You know that, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, so when you get into, you know, you spend 30 hours with yourself, 30 hours just with yourself, you find out a lot about endurance and enduring and hard and subjective and all these words we've used. Um, yeah, Leadville, Leadville, the hundred mile race lit, lit a fire, lit a fire in me and I'm excited to go back. Yeah. I'm excited to follow along. And, and, you know, you mentioned this a few times, but you know, heart is relative. And in the course of this conversation, we've talked about different kinds of heart, um, you know, divorce, different athletic, uh, endeavors that require, uh, mental grit and toughness and endurance. And there are people out there who are listening to this podcast who are going through all different sorts of challenges, facing all different kinds of adversities. And one of the things I love about the platform of podcast is that you get to speak whatever you're going to say next to me and to every single person listening. So if there's someone out there going through a really hard time, maybe they chose it, maybe they didn't, and they get to listen to you right now, what would you say to that person who's struggling right now? that i i would tell them that i i truly know because i felt in my heart and in my body and in my mind a a terrible terrible pain that i had to figure out if i was going to navigate it and if i was going to make it through it so i truly i truly can f can feel for you and you have to make the choice to stand up and to take that step forward, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in two days. It's not going to happen in a week. It's not going to happen in two weeks. And I'm sorry to tell you, it's probably not going to happen in a, in two months. But every single day, you have to wake up and you have to make that choice to take a step. And every single step that you take is going to lead you to a better place. And as long as you speak positive things to yourself you think positive things and you fill your life with things that are, that are going to keep you busy you find you find good friends you find um an outlet you know whether that be a gym whether that be buying a motorcycle to go ride it buying a car going and swimming at the lake paddle boarding you know find an outlet to put your energy into and it doesn't always have to be fitness i you know mine was running and lifting weights um find that outlet use it when you're sad, use it when you're upset and, and just keep going and use that, you know, like we've already spoke on the word endure and what that means. It's how much can you take and keep moving forward? And you can take a lot more than you think. So take that step today, make it to tomorrow, wake up tomorrow, take that step again, wake up tomorrow take that step again. And I can promise you that you have the chance at finding out things about yourself that you will truly never understand that you could have done because I did it. Matt, that is awesome, man. Um, if there's somebody out there listening and just, they feel compelled to reach out to you, uh, to follow along with what you're doing, uh, or just to learn more about you, uh, where's the best place for somebody to do that? Um, Definitely the best place would be on Instagram, um, for sure. Um, my handle, I think it's called a handle. My handle is at Matt Johnson with two underscores. Um, I have a Facebook account. If you have a, if you don't have an Instagram and you have a Facebook account, reach out on Facebook. I'm barely ever on there, but um, you can get me there. Um, reach out to Joe, and he can give you my phone number. It's you know, if you, if you're you know reach out to people. If you're going through, through tough times, I didn't do, I didn't, I didn't go through my tough times alone and you shouldn't either. As much as you want to isolate, as much as you want to, to be sad alone, don't be sad alone. Find others. You could be sad with them because I did that too, because at the end of the day, it, it's going to get better.
I love it, Matt. And uh, I'm so grateful for you sharing everything you did today for all that you do, for the way that you show up in this world and, and for our growing friendship. And I'm really excited to watch you continue growing, continue competing and uh, for whatever's next. And so just thank you from the bottom of my heart, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, no, most definitely. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you reached out. You know, there was a lot of things that, that happened and, and, you know, the time that, you know, you reached out, it, like we already spoke about, it was so odd how all of that lined up and, you know, it was meant to be. I'm glad to be here. Everything happens for a reason. 100%. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor Podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice, and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you, and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing. If you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.